five men have died. A government walks a knife edge. Evidence of the long lost shrine of the Ten Commandments, the Ark of the Covenant, has surfaced. This startling new book and CD-ROM by Jonathan Gray is the culmination of four years of intense investigation and privileged viewing of evidence and artifacts. Nothing will prepare you for the shocking truth. From the site of Noah's Ark to the depths of the Red Sea, the grandeur of Mount Sinai and the ash ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah, these and other new surprising discoveries are brought to life in this series by international explorer, archaeologist and author Jonathan Gray. Oh yes. I have some news for you. It concerns a lost golden chest, over 3,000 years old, called the Ark of the Covenant, and the amazing events which attended the search for it. We might ask what was so special that King Solomon of Israel constructed a massive temple worth billions of dollars simply to house it. Why, if a person touched or looked upon the ark, this golden box, would he drop dead? In 586 BC, it vanished as the armies of Babylon came to destroy Jerusalem. Lost for 2,500 years and found. Just seven days after one of our latest visits to the dig site, Prime Minister Rabin was assassinated. The Israeli government today walks a tightrope. On the one hand, it seeks a peace process with the Arabs. On the other hand, are Jewish religious extremists who want to blow up the Arab holy site, the Dome of the Rock to build a third Jewish temple, and that could spark a holy war. And now emerges a third explosive factor, the Ark of the Covenant discovery. Should political pressures continue to keep this discovery underground, why is this artifact so explosive? Will it play a role in coming events? Is there a connection between the Ark of the Covenant and events soon to take place under the new world order? This compelling report will be presented in four parts. This is a delicate matter, whispered fellow team member Bob Murrell. He glanced around, saw no one following, and spoke again. It's too hot for some people. I stood riveted before the niche in the cliff face. Some 40 feet under me sat the most explosive artefact on earth. They told us to seal off the tunnel mouth, breathed Bob. 
I made the door to lead down and fixed it here. It's several feet under. Did it myself. I surveyed the landscape. A good disguise. We don't deserve to be here, I said, finally. Let's go. For 800 years, the Ark of the Covenant was the most sacred and holy object in the world. Suddenly, in 586 BC, it vanished. In 1982, it was found. It is a discovery so electrifying and so politically explosive that the news was kept secret for over 14 years. Even today, at the request of the host government, not all of the evidence can be revealed. In 1982, when American amateur archaeologist Ron Wyatt claimed to have found the Ark of the Covenant, this claim was not made widely known. In fact, Ron had told only a few of his friends before the host government requested that he keep certain information confidential for the time being. So well was the secret kept that it was not until 1991 that I learned of Ron's claim to discovery. With three decades of experience as an archaeological explorer as well as a skeptic, I set out with a briefcase full of objections against Wyatt's claims. My team was to spend four years investigating the alleged discovery of the Ark of the Covenant. I expected to quickly disprove the claims of Ron Wyatt. However, Intense investigation, repeated visits to dig sites, and privileged viewing of evidence and artefacts left me totally convinced of the truth of the find. It is recorded that the Ark first came into being in the year 1446 BC when it was constructed in the time of Moses to enshrine the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were called the words of the Covenant, hence the chest that contained them was called the Ark of the Covenant. The Hebrew word ark in this context means box. The ark was a wooden chest covered in gold. The lid was made of solid gold and two statues of cherubim, one on each side, were also of solid gold. It is written that the design was handed down by God. The ark was revered by the Hebrews and surrounding nations who heard of supernatural events associated with it. Quite suddenly the ark disappeared from historical records. Long before I got involved, there had been speculations that the Lost Ark was among a dozen of places. Since the Hollywood fantasy Raiders of the Lost Ark was first released back in 1981 with Harrison Ford in the starring role as Indiana Jones, there had been a proliferation of attempts to find the secret hiding place of this famous treasure. The real thing had vanished some 2,500 years ago at least. Its disappearance, according to some people, was the great mystery. At least some adventurers took seriously the possibility of a location in the country of Jordan. Another legend held that the Ark had been transported to Ethiopia, where it was held in great secrecy by local inhabitants. One curious legend had it that when Solomon's temple was destroyed, the Ark had been taken to the Irish Isles by a Jewish prophet. One archaeologist thought to find the Ark at Masada, that cliff-top fortress where Jewish patriots made their last stand against the Romans in the second century AD. Another felt he was on the verge of locating the prize in the Qumran Caves near the Dead Sea after he found what were believed to be ashes of the ceremonial red heifer from the old temple. A cave at En Gedi was also considered to be a possible hiding place for the Ark. Still another speculation put the Ark of the Covenant in a secret spot on the Mount of Olives, east of Old Jerusalem. Another suggested it was in a cave near Bethlehem. But what if the Ark was never moved from Jerusalem? In my book, Dead Men's Secrets, 
I reveal the existence of immense tunnel systems beneath the surface of a great part of the earth, partly natural and partly artificial. In Turkey, for example, I explored the remains of vast underground complexes carved out of the earth in ancient times. Connecting routes linked, it's believed, 14 underground cities in that area. Friends who visited Spain reported to me that they were taken under the earth into the remains of an ancient city of three levels. Jerusalem is a city 4,000 years old. Tunnels, cisterns and such like honeycomb the area beneath the entire city and many of these remain unexplored. Under the Temple Mount alone are 32 caves and cisterns that are known. There are great vaults, secret doors and mysterious passages and the entrances to many of these have been carefully blocked. Passages wide enough for three men to walk abreast cut through the solid rock and connect the old temple site with Mount Zion half a mile away. Some of these remain unexplored. Another tunnel travels almost two miles from the Temple Mount to a spot near the Plaza Hotel in West Jerusalem. Near the Damascus Gate at the entrance to Solomon's quarries is a sign which suggests that one of the caved-in tunnels exiting from the quarries leads to the Temple Mount and we are led to believe that the tunnel continues outside the city walls. Occasionally a few adventurers with written government sanction have been allowed to enter some tunnels but even then those guarding the entrances were very reluctant to let them proceed. And here I learned of a further rumour that in a secret chamber Deep beneath the Temple Mount, the Ark lay hidden. My investigation had led me into numerous localities in a number of countries. I became satisfied that the Ark had not gone to any of these places, that it had not been taken by the Babylonians or the Romans, and that it had not been destroyed either. According to tradition, the Ark and other temple treasures had remained hidden throughout the time of the Babylonian invasions, throughout the 70-year exile of the Jews in Babylonia, and also the entire Second Temple period. They remained hidden throughout the centuries while Jerusalem was under foreign domination and they remained hidden to the present day. Among those who had sought to find the Ark were Adolf Hitler. His Nazis believed the Ark to be a mystical artefact which would give them supernatural powers over mankind. Mussolini also sought to capture the Ark. His fascist army conquered Ethiopia but the Ark eluded him. A man named Eric von Däniken caused a sensation in the 70s when he claimed that the Ark of the Covenant was an extraterrestrial artefact. He asserted that people from outer space had colonised the Earth and that God was an ancient astronaut. The Ark, he thought, was an electrical conductor. Death from touching the Ark was simply from being electrocuted. Von Däniken speculated that if a replica of the Ark were to be made, it would function as a battery. However, I should state that von Däniken provided no evidence to substantiate his theory. As a matter of fact, replicas of the Ark have been made without any such electrical conductivity resulting. But more to the point, our original sources of information concerning the Ark refute such an idea. According to ancient Hebrew texts, the Ark had no independent power as a superweapon. It was powerless, in fact, to present its own capture by the enemy. Yet, the scriptures describe in fearful detail the swift judgment that befell any who dared to desecrate the ark. When captured by the Philistines who lived along the Mediterranean coast, it brought disaster to whatever town hosted it. At Beth Shemesh, more than 70 Jewish men who lined up to peer into it died for their irreverence. The ark was carried by poles inserted through rings at the base of the ark. These poles remained permanently in place so as to avoid any need to touch the ark itself when it was being set down or lifted up. So we may ask, what was the reason for such careful procedure? Apparently there was nothing inherently dangerous about the physical structure of the ark. If we are to believe the ancient writings, the true power of the ark rested only in the divine presence. The Hebrews held that the creator of the universe was holy and that they were unholy. The Ark of the Covenant came to be known as God's earthly throne, so to speak. Since the Holy One could be approached only in holiness, the Ark, which represented God's presence, was to be treated as holy. No unholy man could approach it and live. 
Certainly, when the golden ark is revealed in the ancient writings, it is associated with issues of life and death. During 12 years' research for Dead Men's Secrets, a book on the lost secrets and technology of the past, I sifted through thousands of artefacts, records and tra traditions of the ancient world. If we are to credit the collective testimony of all ancient races, man's early history was truly an incredible one. It was a golden age of advanced civilization, of original giants who had superior intelligence and technology. This appears to have been a universal truth known to everyone in ancient times. And scientific discoveries seem to support this. There are recently discovered artefacts that cannot be dismissed, namely objects of metal setting in museums, unquestionably made in the ancient world, that would have required very advanced technology to produce, a technology not to be repeated until our day. But there is something else. Nearly all writings of ancient peoples worldwide tell the same story of a fall from an original paradise state of peace, love and happiness. A beautiful world, no suffering at all. Their writings speak of a time when animals were neither wild nor harmful, when there was no rivalry or enmity among men, when there was plenty, security, harmony and right living on earth in all directions. Sacred writings affirmed, however, that there had been a departure from harmony with the Creator, from His laws, which were based on love. Such accounts are in the oral and written history of many ancient nations. In ancient Babylon, a man was felt to live under a curse, a spell from which only a divine act of cleansing could free him. Egyptian writings reveal a similar idea that they were in a condition of wrongdoing, that they had a longing for eternal life and even felt a need for some kind of rescue. They were aware that their Creator had surrounded them with evidences of His love, yet they had failed Him. Disobedience had marred that original harmony. Human nature had become so weakened through wrongdoing that it was impossible in one's own strength to resist the power of evil. And it was worse. Now they were separated from the life giver, the Creator. The consequence had been the entry of death, a process passed on to all their children. They also believed in the Creator's love for human beings and in a rescue plan He had promised them immediately after the fall of man, that a mightier one would come down who was to assume human nature and would die for mankind. They believed in the eventual restoration of all that was lost. To help mankind understand the rescue plan, a teaching device had been set up. It became known as the sacrificial system. The requirement was that when a person was sorry for his wrongs, he would take an innocent lamb and kill it with his own hand. The message was that just as an innocent victim, the animal now died, at, so at some future date an innocent deliverer would die for guilty man and free mankind from the curse of everlasting death. Archaeology reveals that this sacrificial system was handed down and became part of the culture of all nations. Eventually, the Ark of the Covenant would be constructed to encapsulate this rescue plan. According to the sacred writings, the time came when the world was becoming so degraded and rapidly losing its knowledge of God. And the Lord chose one nation for a unique role in history. They would become a spiritual beacon, a field of influence in the world. He rescued the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt and gathered them around Mount Sinai in Arabia. They stood there trembling as lightning flashed, thunder rolled and the earth shook violently. Clothed with majesty of fire, the Lord hovered over the mountain and for one singular time in history spoke before a whole nation of people. He spoke audibly the Ten Commandments.
ten laws, brief, comprehensive and authoritative, laws which cover the duty of man to God and to his fellow man, and all based upon the great basic principle of love. You could call them God's ten-point character reference. He wrote them with his own finger on tablets of imperishable stone, written as with a beam of light cutting into the stone. Then he delivered them to Moses, the Hebrew leader, to be placed in a tent of worship. This tent, or tabernacle, erected in the desert was a forerunner of Solomon's temple. The tabernacle was surrounded by a courtyard. In the courtyard was an altar, known as the altar of burnt offerings. This altar was associated with the sacrifice of the lamb and other sacrificial animals. When a person was sorry for his wrongs and came to the courtyard, he would lay his hand upon the animal's head and confess his sin upon it, as though transferring his guilt to the innocent animal. Then he would kill the animal. This was symbolic of the coming Messiah who would die for the sins of each human being. It was a sort of passion play, enacted daily for 1,500 years. Between the altar and the tent was a bowl containing water, symbolic of cleansing. The tabernacle itself contained two rooms, known as the holy place and the most holy place. In the first room were three items of furniture. The seven-branched golden lampstand was a symbol of the coming deliverer who would bring light into our darkened lives. And there was a table of showbread, about the size of a coffee table it was. It represented the coming Messiah as the bread of life, who would spiritually nourish and bring eternal life to all who would accept him. Then there was an altar of incense, before which stood a priest on behalf of the people. The incense rose up from here into the most holy place, representing prayers ascending to God. The sweet-smelling incense represented the perfection of the coming deliverer, which would make our prayers acceptable to God. According to scripture, these objects in Moses' tabernacle were a copy and shadow of the heavenly sanctuary. The priesthood that officiated in the earthly tabernacle was a symbol, a prophecy of the coming one who would one day give his life as a sacrifice, then ascend to heaven to represent mankind before God. Early Christian writers applied this to Jesus Christ. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. That is to say, we have someone in God's very presence standing on our behalf. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. In the tabernacle, the second room was called the most holy place. It contained one object, the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the throne of God in heaven. The Ark of the Covenant was symbolic of God's presence. Over this box there was a lid, known as the mercy seat. The box was overlaid with gold, while the lid and the angels attached to it were of solid gold. A brilliant supernatural light shone above the mercy seat as a symbol of the divine presence. Inside the chest itself were the two tablets of stone written with God's own finger. These contained the words of the Ten Commandments, God's law. This Ark of the Covenant was a teaching model of the divine plan to save mankind. The message was, mankind has sinned, he has broken that law which is the foundation of God's throne, but over this law is the mercy seat, showing that God will have mercy upon us sinners who have broken his law if we turn to him and ask him to help us. Each year the blood of an animal sacrifice was sprinkled upon that mercy seat to indicate that through the shed blood of the coming Saviour, sinners could receive mercy and be restored into the presence of God. From the divine throne emanates both justice and mercy. That is the message of the Ark of the Covenant. It was constructed for that very purpose, to tell what has become known as the gospel story. You see, it's very, very simple. And the reason it was called the Ark of the Covenant was that it enshrined that law which was God's covenant, even the Ten Commandments, to quote the scripture. 
Thus the golden chest was named after the Ten Commandments that were enshrined within it, and the mercy seat placed over it spoke of God's loving mercy to mankind. The ark itself, as we noted earlier, was symbolic of God's throne. The psalmist wrote, Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth go before thy face. You see, friends, God is a God of justice. If I deliberately disobey him and show that I do not want to live in his presence, then I shall die for eternity. That is the message. But if I turn from my sins and ask him to forgive me and help me to live a new life, I receive mercy, and that is his desire. And so this law, the very foundation of God's throne, was transcribed on earth and placed inside the ark in the earthly tabernacle, which was a shadow of the heavenly. This is the significance of the Ark of the Covenant. When mankind turned its back on the Creator, violating those spiritual laws he had been given, the Creator had two options. One, he could have changed the law. He could have said, a person is only a wrongdoer, a sinner, because he breaks my laws. One of those laws is, do not steal. But some people can't help breaking into other people's homes. So I shall cancel that law so that stealing will not be considered sin anymore. We'll just say that violating other people's property is okay. And tell me, friends, would that make us all happy? God could have said, I have a law, thou shalt not commit adultery. Some people can't help committing adultery, so I'll change the rules so that if a man wants to cheat on his wife, it won't matter. I have a law which says, honour your father and mother. But some children find it hard to respect and love their parents. I don't really want those children to be sinners, so I'll change the rules so that children can be rude to their parents and it won't be wrong, it won't be called sin. Yes, the Lord could cancel all his commandments and there'd be no sin, officially. But really, friends, would that solve the problem? Would abolishing these laws bring happiness? Of course not. Such laws are for our protection. The second option was this. Because God's law was an expression of his own character which could not be changed to suit us in our need, somebody would have to die to satisfy the demands of that law which we had broken. So his own son decided to die. This way the holy law of God would remain intact and its demand for judgment would also be met. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast for ever and ever. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now this Ark of the Covenant was eventually placed in Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. It remained there for several hundred years. And then came the time when the armies of Babylon attacked Jerusalem. And some temple priests or other holy men took the Ark of the Covenant and the most sacred temple vessels and hid them in a cave where they could not be found by the Babylonian soldiers. Jewish tradition holds that Jeremiah the prophet hid the Ark. Jeremiah was indeed the prophet in Jerusalem at the time of the Ark's disappearance. So it was that in 586 BC the Babylonians destroyed the Jewish temple. When they carried off the treasure and vessels of that temple, the Ark is not mentioned among the items that were taken away. At this point it vanished from history. And when 70 years later the Jewish people were permitted to return home and build a second temple, it did not contain the Ark of the Covenant. Instead, where the Ark of the Covenant should be, there was now only a table. The Jewish Talmud states that the Ark was non-existent in Herod's temple. In fact, when that second temple was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70, so Josephus, the historian, tells us, nothing was found in the Holy of Holies, including the Ark.
American archaeologist Ronald Wyatt, now a dear friend and colleague, was walking one afternoon outside the Damascus Gate of Jerusalem and he was accompanied by a local authority on Roman antiquities. And they were about 200 metres north of the city wall in front of the escarpment known as Skull Hill. You can see the skull face here. There are the eyes and the nose and so on. This always has been and still is the only place in Jerusalem known as Skull Hill. And these two men, Ron Wyatt and the antiquities expert, were talking about Roman pottery as they walked past this area. And suddenly, Ron's left arm shot out and he said, there's Jeremiah's grotto, the Ark of the Covenants in there. Immediately, he thought, why did I say that? I wasn't even thinking about it. I don't even know where the Ark of the Covenant could be. While he stood in stunned silence, the other man, quite out of character, also reacted strangely. That's wonderful, he said. We want you to excavate. The next day when Ron went for a drive with a head of the Department of Antiquities in Tel Aviv, he told him of his experience and showed him the permit from the landowner. Immediately, the Israeli official granted him an exploratory permit. Actually, an official excavation permit can be granted only to a full-time archaeologist who must be connected with an acceptable sponsoring institution such as a university. Well, in this regard, Ron did not qualify, but he was given a permit. He mumbled something about having to go back home to America the next day because their Apex flight ticket was expiring the next day. And they had no time. They would have to return the next season. And furthermore, Ron would have to research to see why the Ark of the Covenant should even be there. I myself, in my investigations, would go down the same road. I set out, friends, with a briefcase full of objections against Ron Wyatt and his work. I could have sat in an ivory tower, ad-libbing objections of other people, or I could put my money where my mouth was and go out myself. It would cost me everything I had and prove the man wrong. I would lead my expeditions and in five years I would lead or accompany 19 expeditions in the Middle East and I would go down the same road of investigation that Ron Wyatt went down quite independently. Now you'll notice friends that there are two mountains under Old Jerusalem. Mount Zion and Mount Moriah. And on the east of the old city wall is the Mount of Olives. Mount Moriah is that place mentioned in the book of Genesis with reference to the story of the patriarch Abraham from whom are descended the Jews and the Arab. And Abraham was instructed to go to Mount Moriah and sacrifice his son, which was something he knew was not right to do. And yet, because he believed he should always obey his Lord, he went to the mountain. And Isaac said to his father, Father, here's the wood, here's the fire, but where's the animal to sacrifice? Well, Abraham made a statement to Isaac which would turn out to be very prophetic. He said, The Lord will provide himself a lamb. In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Was this a cryptic prophecy that one day on this very mountain the Lord would provide himself as a sacrifice? When Abraham was about to lift that knife, the Lord stopped him and said, 
Abraham, you have shown now that you would be faithful even to giving up your only son. Now, don't kill the lad. Here is a ram caught in the bushes. And that ram, that animal, became a symbol of the coming Messiah who would die. Could it be that the Messiah would die on that very same mountain? Now Jerusalem, the old city wall marked by this dark line, and Mount Moriah marked by the thicker line. You'll notice Mount Moriah is partly inside the old city and partly on the outside of the old city. On the western side of Jerusalem there was a very steep valley, likewise on the south and east, and this meant that any army coming to attack Jerusalem would find it difficult to attack from those three directions. But from the north it was comparatively easy to overrun the city. It was elevated, you see, by this mountain on the outside of the wall. So the early kings of Israel cut a dry moat on the outside of the wall, which effectively made it difficult for enemies to come across. This cut the mountain into two sections. Now Ron was walking north of the Damascus Gate in this area in front of Skull Hill, which was a part of old Mount Moriah when that incident occurred. In this picture we're looking from outside the city back toward the city. Here is the city wall. This white line indicates the extent of Mount Moriah, part of Mount Moriah being inside the city and part being outside. And there is the dry moat in front of the city wall. And Skull Hill is on this escarpment down here. Now, friends, if the Ark of the Covenant and the other temple vessels were going to be hidden, and if Jeremiah knew that the city was about to be destroyed by the soldiers of Babylon, it might not be very wise to hide the Ark of the Covenant inside the city. Outside the city was another wall, a temporary siege wall built by the soldiers of Babylon, constructed at a safe distance from the city to avoid any missiles that might be shot at them from within. And in between there was a no man's land. Now it might not be easy to smuggle the ark out through the Babylonian siege wall, but it could perhaps make sense for it to be hidden somewhere inside the no man's land. And the experience Ron Wyatt had that day was well within the area of that former no man's land. So the following year Ron came back with two others to begin excavation. Truckloads of rubble would first have to be taken away. Now, in ancient times, when a city was destroyed, they would simply knock down what was left and build on top of the rubble. This could occur on the same site many times. And successive levels would rise progressively higher over the centuries. You will notice that in front of Mount Moriah, the land is elevated. Centuries of rubble had been piling up in front of the cliff face, as we see in this old photograph. So to get down to the Babylonian level, it would be necessary to dig down in front of the cliff through this rubble. The hope was to find a cave that might be down at the original ground level. And so the excavation began, immediately in front of the cliff face, progressively deeper and deeper. Well, it was not long before there were uncovered several niches resembling recessed bookcases. And as the digging went deeper, there were found to be three of these. This triggered ideas of a possible event which 
required signs to be placed in these niches for the public to see. For you see, a public road used to run along the front of this cliff face. That's team member Bob Murrell on the left and myself beside one of these niches in the cliff. And it is very close to the place of the skull. The report of Jesus' crucifixion states quite clearly that the place of crucifixion occurred at the place of a skull. The Roman historian Quintilian said this, Whenever we crucify criminals, very crowded highways are chosen, so that many shall see it and be moved by fear of it because all punishment does not pertain so much to revenge as to example. You see, friends, the purpose of crucifixion was to frighten the population into not doing what this crucified victim had done. They made an example of them, and they placed crucifixion sites beside public highways. Now, it is commonly assumed, is it not, that Jesus Christ was crucified on top of a hill. However, in my research, I went through the Gospels, but I did not find one statement in the Scriptures that Jesus Christ was crucified on top of a hill. Did you know that? Where then did we get this idea? Could it be that we have grown accustomed to the concept of the crucifixion taking place on top of a hill, because our artists over the centuries have thus imagined it to be. And one artist, of course, follows another. But the scripture says something different. It says, they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads. Now, friends, the road did not go up the cliff face and over the top. The road went around the front of the cliff face, around the bottom. And that would be much easier for people to pass by, of course. The people were passing by the crucifixion site. The crucifixion site was beside a public thoroughfare. That is, according to the scriptures. Ron and the team decided to make these signs and place them up in the niches to see how well they could be read by people passing by. At the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the accusation was placed in three languages. It was written in Greek. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. In Latin, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. In Hebrew, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Now, that is a lot of writing, especially if you have to display it in three languages. Just try to put all that writing on a little piece of paper over somebody's head on top of a pole. How much of it could be read by passers-by? You could experiment and do what we have done. Next time you go to town, why not stand across the street and read the shop signs? We found that even when shop signs are eight inches high, they are not always easy to read from across the street. That may explain why the Romans placed large signs in niches above and behind a crucifixion site for easy reading by passers-by. Now, in the Gospel record, we find some very interesting statements regarding the signs that were placed up over the cross. The writer John says that the governor, Pilate, wrote a title and put it Epi the Cross. Luke says a superscription also was written Epi him. Now, Epi is also translated above. It's a Greek word. Epi is sometimes translated as on, and sometimes epi is translated over or above. Now it is possible that the titles were put on the cross 
it's also possible that the titles were put over or above the cross. Both options are correct translations of the word epi. However, notice what Luke says. A superscription was written epi him. Just try to make that word epi to read on. Notice, a superscription was written on Jesus. Now surely there was no superscription written physically on him. That's why the translators use the other meaning of epi, which is over. Now if epi could be rendered over in Luke, it could just as correctly be translated over in John. Now, what I'm saying, friends, is that the superscription may have been on the cross, but it would have to be very small, and it would be difficult to read. But it could also be over the cross in big letters and easy to read. I'm not saying that the superscription was not put on the cross, but I am saying that we should not rule out the possibility that it was also over. And that would account for such niches as those in the cliff face. But of course, we are not yet sure that this is a crucifixion site. We are certainly, however, at a place called Skull Hill. However, if we are to position the crucifixion site, it would not be on top of a hill, but in front of the hill beside a public thoroughfare where people were passing by. And if we were to redraw the scene with this new information, perhaps the artist would portray it in a manner such as this. As the digging continued down, there was exposed, about 14 feet below the niches, a bedrock. This was a ledge extended eight feet, about two and a half metres out from the cliff face. And as the overlay of earth was cleared away, there appeared set into the rock a square shape. It appeared to be a plug, a stone plug. On close examination, there were found to be two finger niches with which to pull it up and under that plug was found to be a post hole going down over half a metre, actually 23 and a half inches deep into the rock, a square hole with a plug sealing it over. We have this plug in our possession. It measures 13 inches by 14 inches. It's about four inches thick. Now, running out from this hole in the rock, this post hole, there was a crack. After closer examination, it was concluded that this was not man-made, but rather an earthquake crack. And there was another crack going up the cliff face itself behind this hole. Further clearing away of debris revealed that the bedrock in front of this rocky ledge dropped four feet to a lower bedrock and in that bedrock were an additional three post holes. Now behind the first post hole, the elevated one, a stone wall was uncovered running against the cliff face. Further digging showed this to be the wall of a building. It went out from the cliff face as well. Poking out from the back wall, near the cliff, just behind and above the elevated post hole, was this stone very smooth. One is reminded of an altar stone, perhaps. Now, to recapitulate what we have found here. The cliff face is here. And I've placed a dotted line to represent the position of a ledge. Coming out from behind it, extending 22 feet along the cliff, then 40 feet out from it is this building. Extending from the back wall of this building is what we are pleased to call the 
altar stone. In front of the altar stone is the elevated post hole and four feet lower down three more post holes and in front of them a roundish object which we shall consider shortly. By this time friends the team was beginning to realize that a crucifixion site had been unearthed and this was reported to the Israeli authorities. To look at it from the side here is the cliff face. Here is the back wall of the building. Here is the altar stone. Here is the elevated platform with the cross hole in it. Three cross holes in front. And as the dugout earth was being piled ever higher, there were fears that it might cave back in. There was not sufficient space for piling it further away within this confined area. And then this big roundish stone began to appear. It was like a thick, rounded tabletop. The earth pile was about 10 feet over it, so subsurface interface radar would be brought in to measure it. The thickness was about 2 feet. I'd like you to remember that measurement because we shall return to it later. The diameter of the stone was found to be 13 feet two inches and if you'd like to remember that we shall refer to that later as well 13 feet two inches how old was this building well friends coins were found during the excavation of the building the oldest of them dated from the reign of the Roman Emperor Tiberius who was the Emperor in office at the time of that famous crucifixion of Jesus Christ that, by the way, is an imperial Roman superscription. The most recent coin was dated to around 135 AD, which is rather significant because that was the time when the Romans expelled all Jews from Jerusalem, forbidding them to return on pain of death. This dates the building as having been in use during the first century, the time of the early Christian church. And this would indicate that we have a crucifixion site enclosed here in the first century with, for some reason, this round stone. And the question arises, what is this round stone? Why is it here? If the building around it was constructed to enclose both the cross hole and now this great round stone, what could be its significance? Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new sepulchre, a new burial place. The sepulchre was near at hand. The point is that the tomb was near the crucifixion site and surrounded by a garden. We stand on Mount Moriah. From the top, of Skull Hill, we look into the general area of our story. In 1867, a gentleman bought some land further along the Skull Face Hill from where Ron's excavation would later take place. He wanted to uh, fashion a cistern and cultivate a garden in this area. As he excavated down, he reached the same bedrock level as that which our team would later be working, but several hundred feet further away. And here he unearthed an old tomb. This is the tomb today. This tomb is, friends, very close to the Skull Hill crucifixion site. 
Dame Kathleen Kenyon, the famous British archaeologist, said in about 1970, it is a typical tomb of about the first century AD. In front of this tomb was a trough for the rolling of a stone in front of the tomb entrance. At the right hand side of the trough was this block which would prevent the stone rolling any further to the right. I'm uh, pointing to a cut in the cliff face shaped for a stone that would be rolled to the right. A member of the team, Dr Nathan Meyer, is pointing to a hole pierced into the rock for the insertion of a metal peg which would hold the stone on this right side. This is the trough. On October the 20th, 1995, our team measured the width of this trough, which once held a rolling stone. And do you know what the measurement was? It was two feet wide. The scriptures say there was a tomb nearby owned by a wealthy man named Joseph of the town of Arimathea. Joseph was a secret follower of Jesus Christ. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. And Joseph was horrified when he learnt that the council had, in his absence, condemned this man to death. He now determined to make one bold move to show his loyalty to his Lord. He would donate the tomb that he was preparing for himself for Jesus to be buried in. So Joseph went to the Roman authorities and asked for the body of Jesus, which was granted. They took him down from the cross. They wrapped him in fine linen, then carried him the short distance from the crucifixion site to the tomb. The Gospels say he was a rich man, also that the tomb was new and that no one had ever been laid in this tomb. We now enter the tomb we have been examining. Inside the tomb is large, a tomb which only a rich man could afford to own. We pause and survey a corner of the tomb. On this right side are places for two bodies, one at the rear and another a few feet away. On the left hand side was a room for mourners to weep. Now something here is most interesting. This tomb was measured for a man who expected, of course, one day to lie in it. But this tomb was not used by the person or persons for whom it had been cut out. And you ask, how do we know this? This burial section carved out of the rock to fit one man has clearly been enlarged for somebody else, someone who was taller than the man for whom the tomb had been measured. This does suggest that not the owner, but some other person was laid in this rich man's tomb. There are also indications that this tomb was not even finished. Someone else was interested in the rich man's tomb. The Jewish council hated Jesus so much that they went to the governor and said, Sir, that deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Now command that a guard be placed in front of the tomb, lest his disciples come by night and steal the body and say he is risen from the dead. And that last lie will be worse than the first.
So a guard detachment was stationed at the tomb and a Roman seal placed in front of it. This is what it would look like. You notice that on the left side would be a metal peg, on the right side another metal peg, and across the front the Roman seal. On October the 20th, 1995, our team measured the distance from the peg hole on the left hand side of the tomb to the catch flange for the edge of the stone on the right hand side. And the distance between the two, that is the extreme right and the extreme left, was found to be precisely 13 feet 2 inches the same size as the round stone discovered at the crucifixion site. It has been calculated that such a stone would weigh close to 14 tons. To move it, what would you first have to do? You would have to take out the metal peg. You see, it would be impossible for anybody, even a group of people, to get that stone moving from a dead stop and break off that peg. They would first have to take it out before they could move that stone. It has been calculated by an engineer that such a metal peg could withstand 60 to 80 tonnes of pressure before it actually snapped off. Just imagine all the materials of two brick houses squeezed together, then dropped onto the peg before it would break. Of course, even before that would happen, there would probably be some bending of the metal. It would be totally impossible for anyone to move that stone without first taking out the peg. There is no stone there now. The stone has been moved away. Let me show you the left-hand hole where the peg used to be. Here it is. But wait a moment. What do we have here? Can you see that metal there? What we have, friends, is what's left of a peg, a metal peg that was never taken out of the hole. Instead, it was struck by some colossal force from the right, slightly bent, and sheared off level with the wall, and the stone went away. The peg is evidence. Who was it that did what, humanly speaking, was impossible? Rolled away that stone without taking out the peg. In front of this tomb, there appears to have been cut out of the bedrock a font for baptism by immersion, a first century Christian practice. There is also a squarish foot bath. Foot washing was another early Christian ceremony. Such evidence suggests that the early Christians revered this particular tomb site as special. Let's see the link. Golgotha. Skull Hill. Very close to it we have a crucifixion site surrounded by a first century building. Further away we have a rich man's garden tomb with the seal stone missing. And over at the crucifixion site we have a stone that matches it in size precisely enclosed in a crucifixion site. Who was it that in the first century of our era 
considered this site so important as to link the crucifixion site with the burial site nearby in the first century, the time of the early Christian church, the time of the apostles. Who was it that wanted to commemorate something here that was linked to something there? When these discoveries were going on, friends, there came word from a bishop who had the say as to whether the excavation could continue. He passed down the message, you must cease work. Now, friends, that cave had not been found if there was one. Ron was a Christian, a man of deep prayer, as were virtually all members of the team. And so prayers went up. They went something like this. Dear God, if you really do have in mind that we are to find something here to glorify your name, and if this work is to continue, and if that man is going to fight you and hold up this work, will you in some way that is suitable to you remove him so that we can continue the work? By the end of that week, the bishop dropped dead. By the end of the month, his successor gave permission for the work to continue. I tell you, it's a serious thing to stand against the will of God. Some very wonderful things had been found over this time, but still the object of the search had not been achieved. Eventually, all the cliff face had been excavated and there was nowhere further to go. And still there was no cave found. Over dinner one night, Danny spoke up. Where do we go now? Well, suggested Ron, why don't we break into the cliff face? It would be hard work. It would involve hammer and chisel. Real hard work but it was decided there was no other option. They could only try and see if there might be something hollow inside. To their relief, it wasn't long before they broke through the rock into the open space. Gradually, they enlarged the hole and behind it there appeared a cave. But if they expected something worthwhile for their pains, it was not to be. It turned out that this cavern was just a small part of an extensive honeycomb of natural caves and tunnels inside the mountain. They would pass 12 months on and off of arduous, heartbreaking toil for seemingly no results. One tunnel was so tight you had to exhale just to wriggle through. Then when you tried to take another breath, the passage was so narrow you could only half inhale again. And there were places with deep drops 25, 40 feet down. Tunnels not all connected. Many hours were spent chiseling through cave walls searching for adjacent tunnels. Each time these proved empty. One by one, team members began to lose hope. The owners of the land had granted a permit on condition that Ron restore the land to its original state when the work was done. On one occasion, there were just three members of the party working. One was inside, hacking away at the rock. Another was outside, in the trench, under a bush, for the shade, eating his lunch. And Ron was fiddling with the paper for the radar. 
Suddenly there was heard a voice from above, up on the earth pile. God bless you, Ron Wyatt, for what you are doing. Ron looked up. And there was a tall man dressed like an Arab in clothes very much like those of biblical days. Ron knew that nobody was aware of what they were doing, only the members of the team and the antiquities man. Here was a total stranger who not only knew Ron's name, but said he knew what they were doing. So Ron began to ply the man with questions. Do you live around here? No. Are you a tourist then? No. Well, who are you? Where do you come from? And after a long pause, the stranger replied, I've just been to South Africa and I'm on my way to the New Jerusalem. God bless you, Ron Wyatt, for what you are doing. He turned and he walked away. Ron left his equipment and as he was clambering up the earth pile, the team member eating lunch shouted, I heard every word of that. I didn't see the man. Do you think we've been talking to an angel? Ron ran after the man. There were workmen nearby. Ron asked them, did you see such and such a man who just came down here? They replied, Mr. Wyatt, no one came past here. He ran out to the street and asked the Arab hawkers, Did you see that man? They replied, No, Mr. Wyatt, such a person did not come past here. May I state that with such an experience, the team was suddenly inspired to intensify their work. It was the very impetus they needed to keep going. I uh, have a request for 22-inch 2 before. And so the work continued inside the tunnel systems. Of course, the physical strain was tremendous. Two members of the team actually flew home with double pneumonia. The dust, the tightness inside was becoming unbearable. With one young man who always accompanied him inside, Ron continued on, on this particular afternoon. We'll call this Arab boy Rafat. He was young, about 27 or 28 years of age, and slim. And Rafat was a great help to the team because being so slim, so small, he could squeeze into crevices that might otherwise take hours to widen for the rest of the team to follow. And he could just go in with a torch and look around and see if that area held promise, or he might simply come back and suggest they go the other way. And this would save much time and frustration. So, this particular afternoon, Rafat was up front with Ron, and they were squeezing along. They came to a certain spot and saw a dark cavity ahead. In front of it was a stalactite hanging down. Here's the stub of the stalactite. The stalactite is in our possession as a team. It still retains a sweetish kind of smell. They knocked off the stalactite and Ron said to Rafat, crawl in and take a look. In an instant, Rafat tumbled out. What's in there? What's in there? He cried. I'm not going back in there. He was trembling and shaking. In his eyes was sheer, complete and utter terror. Yet, Rafat said he had seen nothing. Whatever his experience, it was stark and real since he left that chamber and the entire cave system never to return. What was it that Rafat had sensed? Ron would never have given that chamber another look had it not been for Rafat's terror. Now Ron was cautiously excited. He decided to enlarge the hole and had crawled through. He looked at his watch. It was 2 p.m. Only 18 inches clearance, that's all he had. He lay on his stomach inching forward with nothing but the flashlight in his hand into a space that would prove to be a cavern. The beam of light shone forward over the huge pile of rocks. Something shiny caught his eye. He began moving the rocks one at a time. It was slow work. 
There were several objects in the chamber. These were covered over with black, dry rotted animal skins. Over these were dry rotted wooden timbers. And on top of the timbers were stones. And Ron came along over the stones between them and the ceiling. There was a moment when he caught a glimpse of something under the stones. It shone like gold in the torchlight. He spent some time removing the covering to see what was there. He saw gold moulding comprising an alternating pattern of a bell and a pomegranate. His heart raced. He knew what he was seeing. This was an object from the first temple, Solomon's temple, the table of showbread described in the book of Leviticus. Slowly and painfully he crawled over the rocks to the other side of the chamber. Ahead in the torchlight, he glimpsed a black stone case. It had a flat stone top, which was cracked completely in two. The smaller section of the cover was moved aside, creating an opening. Ron now knew what was in that stone case. It was now with that instant realization that Ron passed out. It was 2.45 p.m. when he came to, a mere 45 minutes after entering the chamber. Later, inserting a long pole through the opening at the top of the stone case, attempts would be made to photograph the ark. A Polaroid camera was brought in. The photos turned out foggy. A 35mm camera was brought in. The photos turned out foggy. A video camera was brought in. The photos turned out foggy and Ron concluded that perhaps it was not time for the world to see this yet. In fact, in ancient times, the average person was not permitted to look upon it. Here, Jim Pinkowski, a team member, faithfully reproduces what is actually seen with the eye. I hear someone say, those figures don't look like angels. How do you know they don't? Have you ever seen an angel? Friends, what you are seeing here is what those ancient craftsmen actually made.
chambers. Show you this whole chamber. At times there would be how many men in here, Dale, at one time? No, seven, seven eight. or eight. Nine. Ten. And I'm looking straight up now. In a few minutes we shall let you know the official reaction of the Israeli authorities. Stay tuned. Several more trips were made to the chamber. Eventually, Ron reported to the authorities what he had found. The immediate reaction was, don't tell anybody. Give us time to think what we should do. But I've already told a few people, confessed Ron. Well, what have you told them? Asked the antiquities officer. Ron replied, I've revealed such and such. Realising that what is done is done, they then ordered Ron not to reveal any more details than he had already revealed. The man who was in charge of the Jerusalem sector of the Antiquities Department at that time, when the find was reported, Dan Bahat, a man who was taught at the Hebrew University and is the author of several books, wanted to see this for himself. And so he put on his old clothes, gear that wouldn't matter if it got torn or dirty. And he came and advanced toward the tunnel system. He had scarcely gone three paces toward the entrance when suddenly the strong, fit man collapsed, groaning on the ground. He lay in bed for two weeks, unable to move. After that, the man admitted, My back has never given me trouble before. But I do know this, I'm not going in to try to look at the Ark of the Covenant again. The Israeli authorities do not know how to handle this discovery. The find has made them nervous. I believe there are two reasons. The first is political. Some time ago, a permit was granted to some Israelis to undertake an excavation under the Temple Mount but it was soon reported that workmen had been seen lugging crates into the excavation tunnel. The authorities investigated and found that the tunnel had already penetrated to a spot under the dome of the rock and explosives were being set in place, presumably to blow up the place. The Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, together named the Haram al-Sharif, comprise the third most important place for the Muslim people. Sabotage of the site might well provoke an Islamic Jihad or holy war. You see, there are militant extremists among the Jews who want to get back the Temple Mount and build a third temple. And if they could lay their hands upon the Ark of the Covenant, which would be considered by them as the most precious object for such a temple, 
they would feel quite safe in provoking a war to accomplish that aim if they knew that they had the Ark on their side. And so the Israeli government is very nervous about anyone laying their hands on the Ark or gaining access to it at this time. Government officials now regard this as a critical issue in which the safety of the people must come first. In view of a prospect of a negotiable peace in the Middle East, the present actions of the government are deliberately against any disclosure of what it knows. They have already restricted Israeli religious access to the sensitive temple mount above and below ground. The Israeli government desires to maintain good relations with the Arabs. It does not want to disturb the peace with the Arabs. The situation is explosive at any time. You can walk down the street and get blown up by a suicide bomber. You never know what's going to happen. And so this whole issue has become a political hot potato. Archaeology is currently being used as a weapon. It was just one week after one of our visits to the site in Israel that Prime Minister Rabin was assassinated and the government was blaming one of those disaffected extremists. On a visit into the chamber, the torch was run along the ceiling and there was found to be a crack in the ceiling. The crack was immediately above the crack in the lid of the stone case. The crack came down through the rock, leapt as it were through the air, then started again. Very, very odd. It was decided to investigate the crack in the ceiling. Let's get a metal tape measure, suggested Ron, and see if this comes out somewhere. And so, while one team member sat up by the ledge outside, Ron entered the chamber and began to push the rigid metal tape up through the earthquake crack in the ceiling. Up through the rock, it went. It came out at the left-hand side of the elevated cross hole. The crack extended through 20 feet, 6 metres of solid rock. When Jesus died on the cross, he did not die of crucifixion.
on the evening before Jesus went to the cross, he entered the Gethsemane Garden on the east side of town. The disciples looked at his face and they had never seen him so distressed. He said, I'm going aside to pray for a while. You stay here and you do the same. And they watched him at a distance. He dropped down among those olive trees and began to pray. For some years, Jesus had been predicting his own death as a sacrifice for mankind. Now the moment had arrived. Jesus knew he was about to take upon himself the world's sins to be punished for them. He himself had done no sin. Sin was totally repulsive to him. He shuddered at the thought of the world's guilt descending upon him. His whole life had been leading to this hour. But now his human nature staggered under its horror. Was there no other way to save mankind? Nevertheless, Father, not as I want, but as you will. The horror of it shook him. And in the intense anguish, he again collapsed on the ground. He broke out in a sweat. The agony grew unbearable. As he felt the crushing weight, the horror of the sins of the world descending upon him. And with the sweat, drops of blood oozed from his pores. The death process for our sins had already begun. Men in their wickedness chose to crucify him, but he gave himself willingly. Jesus died of his own choice. of the two do you want me to release to you? We're going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross, if you are the Son of God. <laughs> Jesus was placed on the cross at nine in the morning. The Roman cross was an emblem of their sun worship. By nailing Jesus to the cross, they said, in effect, we offer you to the mercy of the sun god. What an insult to the Creator. The sun continued to rise and by midday it was right overhead. And then it was, friends, that God blacked out the sun. One historian says that the sun was blacked out as far as Rome, the centre of sun worship. The darkness continued 
for three hours. In that darkness, Jesus was alone. He was enduring the wrath of God against sin. Together, they had shared eternity before the world was. And on earth, Jesus would rise early before daybreak, conversing for hours with his Father in heaven to gain strength for his work with mankind during the day. They were closer than Siamese twins. But now, as the darkness descended, it seemed that even his heavenly Father had deserted him. The dreadful thought impressed itself. Even your Father in heaven won't want you now. All this sin you have taken upon yourself has doomed you. You are finished. It was these sins, my sins and yours, friends, that put Jesus through the agonizing terror of that final death that the lost will feel on the judgment day. Jesus was willing to die a death from which there was to be no resurrection if it meant you and I could be restored to God's presence forever. My God! My God! Jesus cried, pierced the darkness. Why have you forsaken me? How the Divine Father must have suffered with his Son. I can imagine him pressing close in the darkness, longing to intervene. But he must hold back and let the penalty be paid. It was Passover day, the 14th day of the month Nisan on the Jewish calendar. Around 3 p.m., according to Jewish custom, the priests were to kill the Passover lamb. Back inside Jerusalem, in the temple, the priest was raising his knife. Suddenly, there was a loud, ripping noise from inside the building. The priest turned with horror to see that great three-inch thick temple curtain being ripped as by unseen hands from top to bottom. And the knife dropped from his nerveless hand and the lamb escaped. At that same moment, outside the city, Jesus cried out, It is finished! Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he died. Animal sacrifices would now have no more validity. The earth shook violently. At the moment of Jesus' death, the rock was torn open. Those who had been standing around the cross mocking were now afraid. Some of them feared the judgment day had come. And the Roman centurion in charge of the soldiers detached to the cross looked up and gasped. Truly this man must be the Son of God. In their continuing hatred, however, the Jewish council of 70 men approached the Roman governor and said, Sir, it's Friday afternoon. The Sabbath will be coming on very soon. It will be a disgrace to have these criminals hanging publicly during the Holy Sabbath. Now they're still alive. The crucifixion victims linger on day after day, as you know. They're not going to die in a hurry. So give us permission to break their legs so that they'll die fast and we can take them down from the cross before sunset. Yes, friends, crucifixion was a painful process. The body would go into cramps. It was difficult to breathe after a while. 
the only way a crucified victim could breathe was to press down on his feet upon the nails and try to lift his body so that he could get air into his lungs to continue breathing. But if his legs were broken, he would not be able to push himself up and soon he would die. There were two thieves, one on each side of Jesus being crucified. They came to the first thief and broke his legs. Then they bypassed Jesus who was in the middle and they went to the thief on the other side and broke his legs. You might say, well, why did they do that? Why didn't they simply go in the right order? The first man, then the second man, then the third man. Why did they go one, three, then lastly come back to the man in the middle? Why didn't they go in the right order? One, two, three. Well, friends, from our archaeological dig, I suggest a possible answer to this. Could it be that originally it had been planned for Jesus to be one of the three in those three lower cross holes? But in their hatred for Jesus, whom they'd been trying to get killed for years, they intervened time and time during the crucifixion because they just hated him so much. And now they tried to intervene again in the placement of the crosses. They said, look, this man is the worst criminal we've ever had. Let's dig another hole in the rock, higher than the other three, and put him up higher where everyone can view him. Put him up as the star attraction of the crucifixion scene. And so the Romans dug another hole, higher than the others and in the middle. And that would account for the fact that the soldiers, when they came to break the legs, did the two men lower down first, victim number one, victim number three, and then they had to climb up four feet, just over a metre, to the man in the middle who was higher up. It's a possible explanation. And so they came to Jesus, and they found he was dead already, and they did not break his legs. They were amazed. It was unheard of for one to die of crucifixion in just six hours. The ordeal of crucifixion could last for days. Something else had caused the death of Jesus. It was not the spear thrust. It was not the pain of the cross that caused Jesus' death. But a broken heart. The priests wished to make sure of the death of Jesus and at their suggestion, I believe, a soldier thrust a spear into his side. And from the wound thus made, there flowed two copious and distinct streams. That blood and water that flowed from his side was medical evidence that he died of a broken heart. It was broken by intense mental anguish because of his perceived separation from his father for eternity. And he died of a physically ruptured heart due to his anguish in carrying the sins of the world upon himself. And friends, that soldier thrust the spear up into Jesus' side and out came two copious streams, one of blood and one of water. And the blood came down, out of his side, down past his legs, down over his feet. It poured into the cross hole and down through the crack in the rock that had been opened to receive it. Then straight onto the lid of the stone case. And it sprinkled onto the mercy seat inside that stone case the mercy seat of the actual Ark of the Covenant. And how do we know that? Because the crack has been closely examined and it shows copious amounts of blood having flowed down into it. It's still there and it's human blood. Samples have been taken from the ceiling and from the stone case lid. 
the Bible says that mercy and truth, the truth is in the Ten Commandments that we have broken God's law and are sinners. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. 600 years earlier, when Jeremiah placed the items in this cave, he had no idea that later the Messiah was going to be sacrificed over this very spot where that cavern was. When the Roman soldiers came along six centuries later to select that particular spot to crucify Jesus Christ, they had no idea that the mercy seat was waiting in the cavern below for that event. There are two mountains in the Bible called Mount of God. The first is Mount Sinai where the Ten Commandments were written on tablets of stone. The second is Mount Moriah where the blood was spilt. On Mount Sinai, God wrote with his own finger those imperishable Ten Commandments. And then the Son of God came with his own blood and sprinkled it on the mercy seat above those identical tablets of the Ten Commandments. That's where mercy met truth. There are other objects in this cave. On the floor, near the stone case, seven oil lamps were found. Lamps such as this one. Now, an interesting thing about these lamps is that there is soot on one side of them. It would have been impossible for Jeremiah and his men to come through the tunnel system that Ron entered. After all, they did not have much time with the Babylonian soldiers at hand. And of course there would not be sufficient space through such a tight tunnel complex to carry the items. There just had to be another way in. And then these lamps were discovered on the ground very close to the stone case. They all had the soot in the same direction and the soot extended onto the stones beside the lamps. And that showed that there had been a breeze coming from the opposite direction. And that breeze must have been through the original entrance to the cave. And so a probe was made of the cave wall. And there was found to be a false wall of stones. And behind that there was a tunnel. Turning to the left, the tunnel was blocked after a short distance with stones to the ceiling. Again, in the opposite direction, it was blocked after just a few feet. Those men who hid the treasures had been careful to ensure that the chamber would not easily be found. And so, friends, after some time, subsurface interface radar was brought into play and there was found a cavity extending outside the city wall of Jerusalem from the vicinity of Solomon's quarry, sometimes called Zedekiah's quarry. As far as could be determined, it ran along about 20 feet, about 6 metres under the ground, in the direction of Skull Hill. And when entrance is eventually made again into the chamber, this will be the way it is done. And if anything ever comes out of this cavern, that should be the way it will come out. Mary Nell, Ron's wife, is here seen crouching at the entrance to the tunnel. Now, what I wanted to point out to you here is in front of me you see some large stones that are blocking an entrance into a chamber. Now, in order to conceal the chamber, they couldn't just block the chamber entrance itself, otherwise this would call attention to it. So they put up a veneer that went around the escarpment some distance, and this would at least confuse anybody that was looking for an entrance and perhaps make them believe that the stone veneer was there for some other reason. 
Now, uh, this wall here was put up very hastily. They have had mortar uh, back to Babylonian and pre-Babylonian times. And this wall, as you will see, instead of mortar, uh, they used some red clay. Now, this tells us that they did all of this in quite a hurry. So given all of this information and the fact that I was in a chamber in this uh, general location, uh, however, it is a little confusing once you crawl around through these tunnels to try to keep oriented if you don't have a compass on you. All right, now, as we're down here with a lot of debris over us, quite enough to bury us. Uh, and some future archaeologists, if time lasts long, would, long enough, would find our remains. That is too much vibration down in this area and would trigger earth slides, which we have experienced several of. So uh, we're going to close this operation down at this point in time and go back and get some metal uh, framing material or shoring material to shore this up so that we can come in here and do this reasonably safely. Okay, Randy, what do you think of the situation there? I think we got a deep hole we're working in. Uh, I'm hoping for success soon. We're praying for it. The second reason why the Israeli government does not know what to do with this discovery is a religious one. Judaism does not accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. What if it were to be officially announced that the man who died on Calvary that Passover day executed by Jewish leaders as an imposter, crucified for blasphemy, was actually the Messiah whose blood had gone onto the mercy seat which was waiting to receive it. Judaism worldwide will be shaken to its roots. Millions of Jewish people will be forced to face the decision whether to acknowledge this man, Yeshua, as the Messiah. The consequent upheaval could trigger political instability as well. It might even bring down the government of the day. The government is sitting on a volcano. Is there a divine plan in this discovery of the Ark? Will something happen soon? I believe so. Certain Jewish rabbis have long believed that the Ark of the Covenant will be exposed at the time when the Messiah is to appear. And indeed, today there is a growing expectation that the Messiah will soon appear. Prophecies fast fulfilling are leading us to the most momentous events of all history. I believe that people who follow their Lord will soon face the greatest crisis ever. More recently, as we have flown into London's Gatwick or Heathrow airports, something has changed. In the past, when a traveller approached the customs area, there was a sign which said, Citizens of the United Kingdom, this way, and all others this way. But now, as one arrives, the sign 
United Kingdom or Great Britain has been taken down and in its place is a sign which says, citizens of the European community this way and all others this way. Friends, national boundaries are on their way down. Referring to the emerging United Europe, the December 9, 1991 issue of Time magazine printed this cartoon of a woman sitting upon a beast. The very symbolism used in the prophecy of Revelation 17 referring to a power which shall emerge in the end times. In 1975, the Club of Rome produced a blueprint for world government in which the whole world is to be divided into ten economic zones with one person as a ruler of each region who will answer to one world ruler at the top. Biblical prophecy says these will have one mind and shall give their power and strength to the beast. A beast meaning a political power. It will be a one world political power. Biblical prophecy states that uh, shortly before the return of Jesus Christ to interrupt human history, there will emerge a new world order in which national boundaries will mean very little. The prophecies of Revelation state that this new world order will draw together the nations of the world under one common dictatorship. And even now, a unified global system is being put into place by a group of powerful men working behind the scenes, men with almost unlimited financial resources who want a global government. And we're being raced into it whether we like it or not. There will emerge a one world economy. David Rockefeller, the powerful leader of the Council for Foreign Relations, said this, all we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. Some economists suggest that for this to occur there may well be triggered an economic disaster in which the stock market will come crashing down overnight. The scenario they paint would be that on a Friday evening everything will close at a peak and on Monday morning the markets will reopen way down and then there will be billions, yes, even trillions of dollars lost by people all over the world. Property prices will collapse and all mortgaged properties will come under the control of the bankers. Because the one world people want control and to control it they have to bring it down and have their own one world monetary system to replace it. And all food supplies will be under their control. Living in the cities will be hazardous. Perhaps it may be time for some of us to consider moving out. And there is a one world religion being planned. Are you aware of that? Friends, it is coming. It's coming rapidly. When the world is reduced to chaos by an economic collapse, I believe that will be the time for the tremendous move that is now being planned to come back to religious laws. It will be argued. See what's happening? We're not being blessed. We need these laws to force people to do it our way. Religious laws will be issued, which are already on the planning board, which although seemingly good and moral, will be contrary to the original commands of God. Biblical prophecy states that eventually economic sanctions will be imposed against people who will not keep these laws so that they cannot even buy or sell. Everyone will receive a number, There'll be something called the mark of the beast and this will be in contradistinction to what prophecy calls the seal of God. You see, God has placed his seal in his law. He says, seal up the law among my disciples. There are two sets of laws, God's laws and man's laws. Man's laws will be enforced by the new world order. Right now, the governments of the world are in league to regulate peace efforts and environmental and trading practices. This is very well known to us all. But behind the scenes, the foundation is already being laid to present a set of universal spiritual laws. And this, friends, is where the attempt will be made to enforce the conscience. It will be decreed that everyone on earth keep one unified day. Everybody, be they Jews or Muslims or infidels or Christians, will be required to observe the environmental Sunday, whether they want to or not. You say, well, what about the Muslims who keep Friday? What will they do when they're forced? 
What about Christians and Jews who keep Saturday? What about those who want to keep Sunday without being forced to keep Sunday? Now friends, one of the most priceless attributes of our Creator is His love of freedom. In the beginning He gave us freedom of choice. Freedom either to love Him or to spit in His face. That's one of the things I love about God. He's a champion of freedom. And this is something that you and I should cherish very deeply. No person on earth has the right to order you and me in spiritual matters. The Lord himself says we have a choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve. As we noted, the Ark of the Covenant was so called because it contained, quote, the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. The scripture says, he hath commanded his covenant forever. And I believe that when the time comes that the spiritual laws are being debated and about to become the law of the land, I believe that at this time, friends, the tablets of God's Ten Commandments written with his own finger will come out as a witness to the world before the fury breaks so that everyone will have a freedom to choose upon enlightened knowledge. In God's perfect time, the Ark of the Covenant will be a witness. He says, my covenant will I not break. Did you know that the only time God spoke audibly and publicly to a group of people, millions of people, was when he spoke his Ten Commandments? He says, I will not alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. And Jesus himself said, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, that's one dot of an I or one cross of a T, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And I ask you now, have heaven and earth passed? Not yet. And when the entire world can see that very ark of God's own presence, then they will see for themselves that his law is real, that his law remains. And friends, this will go like shockwaves across the world, challenging each person to come to a decision either to serve the Lord or to obey man. In the revelation prophecy of events, just before Jesus' return, when human laws enforce the mark of the beast, as it is called, God's faithful people are described as those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You see, this is a showdown, and there will be no compromise. If you stand for Jesus, he will stand for you. The prophecy of Daniel tells us that at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And that's God's book of life. You need not be afraid of what's coming. I would hope that anything I have just revealed to you will, will not make you afraid, but will make you rather aware and prepared. To be forewarned is to be forearmed, isn't that correct? Many of you may be out in the forests or the mountains, even hiding from powers that seek you. This has already happened in times of history in the past, and we are told in the prophecy that the times ahead, brief though they may be, are going to be as intense as any times in the past. But the Lord promises you will not starve, your bread and your water shall be sure. It is all very well to find the Ark of the Covenant, but what is the purpose of all this? In seminars worldwide, I stress that these discoveries are part of what the Lord himself is doing to prepare the world for his coming. May I ask you, are you prepared for that event? If not, why not just simply admit to God that you have done wrong, all of us are sinners, look to Jesus to rescue you from your wrongs, and then ask for God's Holy Spirit to change your life. 
The Lord has now linked earth to heaven with a tie that can never be broken. He loves you. He made you. He died for you. How are you going to respond?